Now, my text this morning is found in Colossians chapter 1. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles there, Colossians 1. I'm going to be dealing with verses 12 through 14 concerning the subject of qualified, delivered, and forgiven. Qualified, delivered, and forgiven. That psalm that I had Brother Mark read is a special, special psalm, as they all are. But it's a psalm of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it begins by asking a pertinent question that we all must face. It says this in Psalm 24, verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now that's a way of asking this question. Who's going to come into the presence of Almighty God? Who's going to be accepted with God? Who's going to be favored with God? Who's going to do that? It says, or who shall, stand, who shall stand in his holy place? The place of holiness. Well, here's the answer. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 24. It says, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. That's who. Now, if God the Holy Spirit has convinced you or me of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, we'll know this, that based upon ourselves, based upon what we find within ourselves, Based upon our works, verse 4 disqualifies us. Do you know that? It disqualifies me. Somebody says, but you're a preacher. Still disqualifies me. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, preaching to others who are saved by grace, and some who are still lost in their sins. He that hath clean hands, that's sinlessly perfect, a pure heart, that's no thought of sin, no motive, pure. But then he gives us some hope. Look at verse 5, he says, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, if you've got clean hands and a pure heart, why would you need salvation? You see, a person who is not drowning, you don't need to jump in the pool and save him. But now, if you're a sinner, then you need salvation. Christ's name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? Their sins. So if you're not a sinner, you don't need salvation. In fact, I don't even know why you're here this morning. Because you're just sitting here uh, amidst a bunch of sinners. It's like, why would you go to the hospital if you're not sick? So he's talking about righteousness from the God of his salvation. And who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about sinners saved by grace based upon the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 6, This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, or O God of Jacob. Those who seek the Lord there are those who are God's elect. They are those whom the Holy Spirit has given life, and they seek him, and they seek the God of Jacob. Jacob is specifically mentioned because he is one of the major types in the Bible of sinners who do not deserve salvation, but who are saved by the sovereign grace of God through the righteousness, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the last part of that psalm, he shows you how all this comes about. Look at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, 
and the king of glory shall come in. That's how it all comes about, through the king of glory. And who is the king of glory? Verse 8, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who's that talking about? That's talking about Christ. He's the king of glory. He's the one strong and mighty in battle. He went to war against sin. He went to war against Satan. He went to war against death. And he was mighty in battle. He conquered them all by his, his obedience unto death on the cross as the surety and the substitute of his people. How in the world could I say that I have clean hands? I'm a sinner. There's only one way I can make that statement honestly before God and before you. And that is based upon the righteousness, the cleanliness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed charge to me. How can I say I have a pure heart? Well, what is a pure heart in the Bible? It's a pure, it's a heart, the mind, the affections, the will, the conscience that the Holy Spirit has sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now that's the pure heart. It doesn't mean that in my mind I don't have evil thoughts, sinful thoughts. I do. I have to fight it. It's a warfare. But what can wash away my sins? What keeps God from charging me with my sins? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, is risen again. Seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for me. He says, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity and sworn deceitfully. That's a, that's a way of describing unbelievers. Those who have lifted up their soul unto vanity. They imagine that God will, will save them or bless them or accept them based upon their works, their efforts, their cooperation, their decisions. God will not accept you based upon that. There's only one ground upon which God will accept a sinner. And I've already stated it. Those who have received righteousness from the Lord. The righteousness of Christ. The blood of Christ. And when you see that and believe that and submit to that, you can honestly say you have not lifted up your soul unto vanity. Doesn't mean you don't still have sinful pride. You do. We all do. But it means when it comes to, a, to salvation and a right relationship with God, I have only one hope. And that hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's it. He's the king of glory. Lift up your heads, he says in verse 9. O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. He's the forerunner of his people. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He's the Lord that cannot be defeated. He's the king of glory. Now think about that. Now turn to Colossians 1. Now, if what I've just preached is your hope, if that's your hope, if that's really your hope, and if it's really my hope, then let me tell you what we ought to be doing. We ought to be spending our lives giving thanks unto the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. He's talking about giving thanks unto the Father. How can I look upon God as my Father? Instead of my righteous judge, he must be both. And the first thing he says about giving thanks unto the Father, look at it. If we're truly sinners saved by God's grace in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, is there any limit to the debt of love and gratitude that we owe our Heavenly Father? That's a debt that will never be paid, but it's not a legal debt of law. Understand that. If we're in Christ, we do not owe any debt to God's law and justice. It's paid in full. He redeemed me. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. My debt to God's law and justice is paid in full by the death of Christ. I don't owe a debt, legal debt. 
But I'll tell you something. We owe God everything, our very lives, in that debt of love and gratitude. We're to express our gratitude in faith, believing God, repentance, turning away from self, perseverance, clinging on to Christ and holding on to him for dear life, obedience, worship, and praise, not to be saved, but because we already are by his grace. Not to purify ourselves in such a way as to make ourselves fit and qualified for heaven, but because we already are. You see, these are not ways by which we earn God's favor and blessings. These are not the, bound, the, the, the uh, uh, grounds upon which we ascend unto the hill of the Lord. They're ways that we express our love and our gratitude to God for all that he has freely, unconditionally given us in Christ. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so in our text here in Colossians 1, we have the summation in three words. Have a summation of all this in three words of all spiritual blessings given us. And the first one is the word, look here in verse 12. It's the word meet, M-E-E-T. It means qualified. That's what it means. Look at it, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet, qualified to be partakers of, that word partaker simply means what it says, to take part in, to share in. We take part in, we share in, partakers of the inheritance. What is the inheritance? The inheritance is salvation and all of its blessings and benefits, eternal life and glory. And it is an inheritance. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's all of grace. Christ is the one who paid the price. And it's the inheritance of the saints who are the saints. That's not somebody that some funny guy in Rome canonizes and checks out who did things, uh, whether or not they did miracles. No, uh, listen, if you're a believer this morning, you're a saint. That means sanctified one, one whom God has set apart. And if you're a saint, you're a sinner saved by grace, you're washed in the blood of Christ, clothed in his righteousness, and you are a possessor of an inheritance. Peter said it was an inheritance that's incorruptible and cannot be taken away. So it's the inheritance of the saints, those who believe in Christ, and it's the inheritance of the saints in light. What is light? Light is truth. Not in believing a lie. People today call Christianity salvation by the grace of God conditioned on you, conditioned on me. That's a lie. That's not Christianity. Christianity is salvation conditioned on Christ. Christianity is Christ who fulfilled those conditions. Christianity is that which Christ accomplished that ensures the salvation of all for whom he died, was buried, and arose again. That's God's grace. Grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh me I will in no wise cast out. What qualifies me for salvation? What qualifies you for salvation? For blessings? For eternal life and glory? Listen to me. It's not our faith that qualifies us. It's not our repentance that qualifies us. It's not our obedience. It's not our sincerity. It's not our good intentions. It is Christ crucified and risen from the dead alone. You understand that? It's his blood that washes away all my sins, that makes me clean. It's his righteousness charged, accounted, imputed to me that justifies me before God eternally. It's his power that gives spiritual life and knowledge whereupon we're given the gifts of faith and repentance to lay hold of him who qualifies us. You see the difference? Those who believe their faith qualifies them for salvation, you know what they believe in? They believe in their faith. They have faith in their faith, not in Christ. If you have true saving faith, you have faith in him 
who qualifies you by his blood, by his righteousness. It's his power that preserves us unto glory by which he causes us to perse persevere. Christ is all and in all. That's our hope. That's our ground. I have no qualifications for salvation, for blessing, for benefits from God, for a right relationship with God. I have no qualifications to ascend unto the, to the hill of God's holy, holy presence, but Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead, his righteousness imputed. That's my only qualification. Now that's it. Yes, God gives us faith to believe. Yes, he brings us to repentance, which is a gift of God. Yes, he preserves us unto glory by causing us to persevere. But that's not our qualifications. One qualification, the blood of Jesus Christ. All right, here's the second word. Look at verse 13. Who hath delivered us. We're not only qualified, we've been delivered. Christ has delivered us. From the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Christ has delivered us from the legal debt of sin and the law by being made sin for us and dying on the cross to make us legally righteous in God's sight. That's deliverance by redemption. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 it talks about the, that Christ is the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself did what? Purged our sins. You see, you, didn't, you weren't there in, in person. You were there, if you're a believer, you were there in, in a representative, in a substitute, in a sure, but you didn't help him. You didn't help him out in this man. He by himself purged our sins. And when he did it, what did he do? He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, this picture that preachers paint today of Christ hanging over the banister of heaven trying to beg and plead you to walk the aisle for him, that's not scriptural. He sat down. <laughs> sat down. Why? Because he said it. It's finished. What's finished? Our sins are put away. Righteousness has established, is established. God is just to justify the ungodly. He secured the salvation of all for whom he died. And as a result of this deliverance by redemption, through Christ assured in substitute, you know what he does? Look at verse 13 again. He delivers us from the power of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's, deli that's deliverance by the power of, the, of Christ through the Holy Spirit in regeneration and conversion, in the new birth. You see, Christ's righteousness imputed to us is the ground of our salvation, and it's the source and power of our regeneration. Turn over to Galatians chapter 4, if you will. Let me show you this. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it speaks of God sending forth his son. In verse 4 of Galatians 4, it says, when the fullness of the time was come. That was the time that God appointed before the foundation of the world. In sovereign electing grace when he chose his people in Christ and gave them to Christ and determined to save them by his grace through Christ. Well, when that time came, God sent forth his son, that's his deity, Christ is the second person of the Trinity, made of a woman, that's his sinless humanity, he's God and man, God manifest in the flesh, made under the law. That's all of salvation conditioned on Christ, his law keeping, his justice satisfying death, and he did it to do what? Verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that's our... That's our, uh, uh, the ground of our justification is the redemptive work of Christ, which was the price, the price was his blood. Now look at the next line. That we might receive the adoption of sons. See, that's all based upon what Christ did. Verse 6, and be, listen to this. And because you are sons, or since you are sons, 
Now, whatever he's going to say, it's not said in order that we might become sons. It's because we are already sons, children of God. Because, and that by the blood of Christ, by the electing grace of God before the foundation of the world, and by the redeeming grace of God through Christ on the cross, we're already adopted into his family, already children of God, and how do we know that we're children of God? Look at verse 6, that because you are sons, or since you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, what is that? That's talking about the new birth. The Holy Spirit gives life to the children of God, spiritual life. He raises us literally, spiritually from the dead. And what does he do? He gives us new knowledge. He reveals things to us. Look at verse 13 of Colossians 1 again. He delivers us from the power of darkness. You know what the power of darkness is? It's the power of, it's the power of ignorance and deception. That's what darkness is. Satan uses that power to keep sinners in a state of unbelief. We read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. Remember what it says? If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that seeth not. That they, might, that they might not see the glory of God in Christ. That's basically what it says. All right? That's the darkness. It's the darkness of sin. And never forget this. It's the darkness of man's false free will works religion. It's the darkness that keeps sinners thinking that they make the difference in saved and lost. That they, that they, that salvation is conditioned on them and what they do rather than upon Christ and what he did. It's the darkness of false, false gospels that set sinners on to what they call obedience but aimed at establishing their own righteousness before God rather than submitting to Christ as their only righteousness before God. Well, when the Holy Spirit comes in power from Christ, he delivers us from that through the preaching of the gospel. That's why Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and the Greek also, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What is the righteousness of God there? It's what Christ did. It's the merits of his obedience unto death. It's his righteousness imputed. It's his blood. That's what the gospel reveals. And when he delivers us from that darkness, verse 13, he translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom of Christ. What is the kingdom of Christ? Well, it's his church. That's the kingdom. It's his spiritual kingdom. What he does is he removes us from one state to the other. Whereas we were in darkness, now we're children of light. You know what the word church means? It doesn't mean denominations. It means called out ones. Called out of darkness into his marvelous life. You see, if you're a believer, and I've said this often, if you're a believer, you're a walking, talking miracle of God's grace and power. You're not the product of your free will. You're not the product of your decision. You're not the product of your baptism. You're the product of the sovereign grace of God in Christ. You're the product of his death. Christ's death. He said, unless the seed of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it won't bear fruit. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Who's the fruit there? That's his people, his children, his sons, his daughters. How do I know if I'm a child of God? How do I know if I've been adopted into his family? How do I know if I've been redeemed by the grace of God? How do I know if I've been qualified 
to stand on God's holy presence based on the righteousness of Christ imputed. How do I know that I've been chosen of God? Well, have I been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son, his church? That's not every denomination now. That's just where the gospel is preached, where the truth, it's the, remember, it's the inheritance of the saints in light, not in darkness. The Bible says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. First comes righteousness. That's the ground. That's the cause. That's in Christ. That's his righteousness imputed. Then comes peace. Within our hearts. Based upon what Christ did, we have peace. Peace that passes understanding. And out of that peace comes joy in the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 14. Here's the third word, forgiven. He says in verse 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The reason that forgiveness is so emphasized in the Bible, is this. And it's for his people. It's for those who are qualified through Christ by the grace of God. It's for those who've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Why do we need to have that emphasis on the forgiveness of sin by the blood of Christ? And I'll tell you why. It's because even as qualified and delivered by the grace of God, we are still sinners in ourselves. God states that in Christ, based on his righteousness imputed, that we are truly and really righteous, perfectly righteous in his sight, legally, objectively, forensically. But I'll tell you what, brother or sister in Christ, we just don't see that in ourselves, do we? When I look at myself in the mirror, I don't see one who is perfectly righteous. I know it's true, and I know it's true because God says it. That's faith, walking by faith, not by sight. I don't feel it. How about you? We war against the flesh. We struggle. We grieve. We suffer. We try to figure it out, and we can't. Why is God doing this to me? You know, that kind of thing. We can't figure that out. We have to be convinced by the Holy Spirit that we're truly and completely redeemed and forgiven of all our sins through the blood, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? And the only way we know it, God said it, and that settles it. Think about it. We've sinned today, haven't we? Anybody that's here, haven't we sinned today? Won't we sinned more? But here's what I'm telling you. If God chose you and Christ redeemed you and you're qualified by his righteousness alone, God will not impute sin to you. Do you believe that? I'm going to tell you something. It takes the power of God's grace to really believe that. Because I don't feel like it right now. We suffer the consequences of our sin. Old age, sickness. It's a, it's a, we're just in a... We can't get away from it. Paul said that. He said, I, I want to do good, but I don't even know how. Do you know how? Christ, the Lord, acted thought, walked in a perfect way at all times. I don't know how to do that. Do you? If you do, draw me up a manual, and you better have scripture backing it up because it's not in there. We don't even know how to do it. You know, these people who say, well, I finally achieved sinless perfection. I don't even know how to do that, and they're lying to themselves. They just told a big lie right there. Sin is all we see around us and in us as far as our experience and sight. But we know who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. It's God that justifies. Who can condemn? Sin cannot condemn us. See, 
our sins are forgiven. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. I had a preacher years ago tell me one time, he said, he said, at the end of the day, he's a false preacher, by the way. He said, at the end of the day, he said, if we don't ask God to forgive us of every sin we committed that day, he won't forgive us. Now, if you dwell on that too much, you're going to end up somewhere where you don't want to be. I told him, I said, son, I've committed sins today I don't even know. What about sins of omission? I, cannot, I can tell you right now, I have not had a second in myself where I could say I'm perfectly holy and righteous and pure and uncontaminated from sin. You see, I need forgiveness all the time. <laughs> How about you? Well, where's that going to come from? You say, well, cry enough, and maybe that'll do it. No, that won't do it. You know, we ought to feel sorry for our sins more than what we do. But, you know, repentance is not feeling sorry for your sins. Repentance is a change of mind on the basis of the forgiveness of sins. What is the ground of the forgiveness of sins? The blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody says, but if we confess our sin, I'm going to tell you something. If you know that Christ's blood is the only ground of your forgiveness of all your sins, that is confessing. I'm a sinner. I know right now if God were to give me what I've earned or deserved, it would be an eternal damnation. That's what I confess. And I confess I have no hope of forgiveness but the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ.